This is one of a series of short films about some of the historic and prehistoric sites in South Wales. These are some of the more interesting, but not always well-known sites. This is the Church of St Eltid. The current building is very large for a parish church. It's almost 46 metres long, almost the size of a, a small cathedral. It runs approximately east northeast to west southwest, but it has lost its cruciform or cross shape over time. To explain more about the church, we are joined by Madeline Gray, Professor of Ecclesiastical History at the University of South Wales. So like a lot of churches in Wales, this one has been built up from early beginnings and has a, has a long period where it's been, it's been put together, if you like. Yeah. What are the, the earliest parts of the church that we can see? Well, the only actual part of the building you can see is through that door there. It's the, the west part of the old church. And what you're looking at is a bit of Norman statement architecture. As, as you said, the early medieval monastery, even in the days of its great glory, would have been, in terms of its buildings, very unassuming. But when the Normans came to South Wales, they came with this tradition of building stone churches. They came with a mission to reform the church because they didn't like the way that the Celtic church was doing things. So they took the property of St. Etitid's monastery, they gave it to Tewkesbury Abbey. And they also came with this idea that they were going to build stone churches to put their mark on the landscape to say, you know, here we are and this is what we're doing. So what you see through there, the west part of the old church, it's built in the 12th century, then gets a bit of a reworking in the early 13th. They tack on the tower, for example. And then there's a bit more work in the late 13th century. They build the furthest bit that you can see through those doors, um, the, what's now the east part of the church and the chancel. The bit where we're sitting now is probably 13th century to start off with. And it's built just as a bit of an add-on to make the church even bigger and more impressive. And then in the 15th century, this gets used as a chantry chapel for the Raglan family. So that brings us to this part of the church. Mm. And of course, there are these very early uh, Celtic Christian crosses that we can mm. see. Yes, nothing going back to the time of St. Ishtid, unfortunately. Mm. I mean, the name Ishtid does appear on that stone there. Mm -hmm. But I think that is because, I mean, it's, it's a 9th century stone, but it's being put up in Ishtid's community. You know, you want to remind people, this is the saint, he's still looking after us. Mm. And they're, they're all stones which commemorate dead people. And some of them do seem to be more or less asking for prayer for their souls. Mm. Um, so the, there are other crosses in the church mm. as well, I believe. Yeah. I think moving towards that end, you've got yes. some, is it some inscribed crosses yes, on the are, walls? there are quite so? a lot of later medieval tombstones as well, very rich collection. And then, interestingly, some post-medieval tombstones, which have still got crosses on them. Now, you weren't supposed to do this after the Reformation. It was a bit non-PC, you know. Yeah. But it seems to have survived in this area. And it's not that they were people who were Catholics, because the vicar, 17th century vicar, mm. has crosses carved on his tombstone and on the tombstones of his... His first wife died before him, and then he married again and there's one on the tombstone of his second wife. So it was a local tradition, and we just went on doing it. And just beyond there, we have the early wall paintings, don't we? And there was one that even greeted me as I came into the church. Oh, yes, and of course it's a wall painting of St Christopher. It's your namesaint. And Christopher would have been probably the most important saint for a lot of the people using the church. The story of St Christopher, he's a giant, he carries people across the river, he carries the Christ child across the river. And now he's the patron saint of travellers. But in the Middle Ages he was much more important than that because he was the saint who would look after you in the hour of your death. I mean, he carried the Christ child across the river, he would bring Jesus to you when you were dying. The medieval tradition was that if you saw a picture of St Christopher, that day you would not die an evil death, not that you wouldn't die, because that wasn't really important. What was important was getting it right. You know, dying was a bit like the modern driving test. You know, you could practice for it, you could prepare, you could buy books about it. You could get it right, 
you get it horribly wrong, like I did on my first driving test. <laughs> and St Christopher would make sure you got it right. He would make sure the priest got to you to help you, to hear your confession. If the priest couldn't get to you, God would hear you. So it was really important. And this was right opposite the, the yeah. front door this is on immediately purpose. opposite the door, so it's not difficult for you to see. You just poke your head in and look around and there you are, there you're right for the day. And, and further along we have, I think is it Mary Magdalene? Oh, yeah. With yeah. her, her vial of enough, oil. My name's Saint. That's an amazing coincidence. Well. And that it well, obviously that one's my favourite, but it's my favourite because it is such a complex image. Now, the medieval tradition about Mary Magdalene, it rolls together a lot of the different Marys in the Bible stories and makes it into a bit of a fantasy picture of a beautiful young woman who becomes a prostitute, sees Jesus, repents of the evil life she's been leading. She has a little jar of ointment with her. She breaks it. She puts the ointment on his feet. She cries her eyes out, she wets his feet with her tears, she dries them with her great long hair. She's there at the crucifixion, she's also there at the resurrection. And all that is tied up in that painting. She's got that little vessel of precious ointment. Yes, it's the sign of her penitence, but if you think about it, what she's doing is also like the last of the Catholic sacraments. She's anointing someone before his death. So she's actually a woman ministering to Jesus, performing one of the sacraments. That's a, a hugely yeah, important huge message. Important. And it suggests that uh, the wall paintings yeah. of the time weren't just uh, an illustration, just, there is little, decoration. Little pictures for people, you know, little pictures for simple folk. Mm. There are hugely complicated arguments going on behind them. The other thing about Mary Magdalene, she's got her other hand raised in witness. She was the first person to see the resurrected Christ. She was the first person to announce the resurrection. She's described in the Middle Ages as the apostle to the apostles. So she's preaching. That, again, you know, huge argument mm. about the role of women in the church. And although the people who saw those paintings, they weren't literate as we would understand it. They couldn't decode a page of unfamiliar text. Mm. But they were visually very, very literate. And they could engage with these big debates they weren't stupid um and right to the the side uh, mm. of those paintings mm. there's a, a rare jesse niche oh, there's think, that jesse it? niche yes and that again is unusual because it, it's quite an early one right you, you get them later in the middle ages and that again is a very complex piece of imagery it's jesus's human family tree as it's set out in the gospels and then the niche in the middle probably originally it had a statue of the Virgin and Child. So again, you've got a very complicated discussion of the mystery of the Incarnation. It, 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 it's not for stupid people. Are there any, uh, following on from that, are there any yeah. uh, later pieces within the church? Well, yes, if you look right up towards the East End, you've mm -hmm. got that gorgeous um, late 14th century Reredos, which would originally have been much more elaborate than it is now because all those niches would have had statues in, the whole thing would have been painted and gilded. We can only imagine what it might have looked like. So what's your impression, given all these different yeah. elements? We've got yeah. the 9th century, yeah. this end, if you like, coming through to 17th, 18th yeah. century, yeah. throughout. Yeah. Um, it's disparate elements. What's your impression of the church as a whole? It's amazing how it all does come together, isn't it? And what I really like is the way that they've rebuilt this west end of the church. And it's still part of the church. They were very, very keen that it shouldn't feel like a museum. It should still feel like part of the church. So, you know, it's, it's still a hub for a lot of local activity. It's a hub for studying the history of the area. And you, you can still feel the spirit of St. Ilted inspiring what's going on here now.